Hi, it's Christina with the Sisyphean Journal. Today's August 6th, and I'm going to link to today's anniversary video below. Um, I've been making my way through the Kermit Gosnell Grand Jury Report, and I've decided today, instead of just going through it in order, I'm going to specifically look at the National Abortion Federation, supposedly the cream of the crop. I'm just going to search for when it shows up in the Grand Jury Report. The first mention um, says, NAF is an association of abortion providers that upholds the strictest health and legal standards for its members. No, it has them in writing. It does not enforce them. Uh, I have, I'll link below to the playlist about the stuff that has gone on at National Abortion Federation clinics. Um, for just two examples, Hanan Rotem, who was caught allowing a receptionist to administer general anesthesia, and Kermit, I mean, I'm sorry, um, Abu, the butcher of Avenue A, Hyatt, were both members of the National Abortion Federation. Hyatt was so appalling that when I was at Life Dynamics, I quipped that hate mail was coming with clip clippings about him. Um, so I'm going to provide links below and you can look and you can see if the National Abortion Federation is all it's cracked up to be. Gosnell bizarrely applied for admission shortly after Karnamaya Mongar's death. And it's kind of weird because he had obviously been attending National Abortion Federation events prior to Karnamaya Mongar's death. Um, he told an interviewer that he got the idea for snipping, which is how he killed the babies, the scissors right here, from attending the 2002 National Abortion Federation Risk Management Seminar in Dallas, where Martin Haskell did his DNX, dilation extraction presentation, what was later dubbed partial birth abortion, where you drag the baby out by the feet and you poke scissors right in here to make a hole. You, you pull the baby out until just the head is still lodged in the mother's body. Um, poke a hole with scissors, and then stick the cannula through that hole and suction out the baby's brain and collapse the head. Um, Gosnell apparently had been doing that, but it's bizarre. He's so willing to break the law left and right. Um, after the partial birth abortion ban went into effect, Gosnell did attempt to kill the babies prior to starting the procedure where you drag them out feet first, stab them in the back of the neck, and then suction out their brain. But he just totally sucked at it. He just had no skill to use the digoxin to kill the baby beforehand. So he just told his staff, never mind, I don't need to worry about it. So why does he choose after she dies to join when obviously he is already immersed in it? Um, despite his various efforts to fool her, the evaluator from NAF readily noted the records that were not properly kept, risks that were not explained, patients were not monitored, equipment was not available, anesthesia was, with, was misused. It was the worst abortion clinic she had ever inspected. Of course, she rejected Gosnell's application. She just never told anyone in authority about all the horrible, dangerous things she had seen. Not only did she apparently not tell anybody in authority, um, the National Abortion Federation took no action even within their own ranks. NAF members continued to refer women to this place, and he continued to work at Leroy Brinkley's National Abortion Federation Clinic in Delaware, starting illegal third trimester abortions there in the National Abortion Federation member clinic and then finishing them at his House of Horrors in Philadelphia. And he continued doing that. This woman didn't take any action other than saying, well, we don't want to put our sticker on your door. Um, so now we go to um, oh, I forget O'Neill's first name. Do, do, do. She wasn't a doctor. Where's O'Neill? Do, do, do. O'Neill. I can't find her first name. Eileen O'Neill. Okay, so she was an unlicensed doctor that was working at the clinic. And Gosnell introduced her to the NAF evaluator as 
a doctor who performed the first trimester abortions that um, were just prescribing the abortion pills. And O'Neill confirmed to the evaluator that she did treat those patients. So I, I can't really fault NAF for not noticing that she wasn't a doctor when they were so grossed out by everything else. I mean, yeah, you know, I'd have walked in, seen the cat crap, and walked right out. But, you know, I guess NAF figured that maybe he could clean that up. Um, and then we're going to get into a little bit more depth. Immediately following Karnamaya Mongar's death in November 2009, Gosnell sought membership in the National Abortion Federation, a professional association of 400 abortion providers nationwide that offers referrals and services to member providers. And that's one of the biggies. They re um, you can, the membership dues are either a flat rate or um, a certain amount per abortion performed, whichever amount is higher. Um, so NAF has a huge vested interest in making sure that their members do lots and lots and lots and lots and lots of abortions because they get a portion of the take. Um, Membership is contingent on meeting NAF's quality assurance standards and it's based on an on-site inspection. I'm not too sure about meeting the standards. I've covered that already. It is inexplicable that Gosnell believed he could somehow pass such an inspection or meet NAF standards. Um, maybe he had visited other member clinics and saw that they were kind of slipshod and decided, well, if they're good enough, maybe I am too. Because again, follow the link. There was some pretty appalling stuff going on at NAF clinics. A NAF quality assurance evaluator testified before the grand jury. She stated that NAF's mission is to ensure safe, legal, and acceptable abortion care and to promote health and justice for women. Not really. Um, as Rana Chai Banchangmani said, and he was a, an abortionist that he had human feces in the stairwell, so his place was pretty nasty. That NAF was a bunch of abortion providers that band together for the purpose of their own benefit. Um, one National Abortion Federation meeting where I listened to the tapes, um, a lawyer from the ACLU Reproductive Rights Project was telling them to quit committing malpractice because she was tired of her words beating the shit out of this woman to get her to drop her suit. So this is an organization that would defend its members when they injured and killed women. And that the, their strategy for avoiding lawsuits was not to quit committing malpractice. It was um, to basically try slut shaming the women into dropping their suits. So uh, to that end, NAF publishes clinical standards called clinical policy guidelines that members must follow. Again, they're in writing. I have not seen a whole lot of evidence that they are actually required to follow them. They can if they choose to, but I don't think NAF is real good at enforcing that. These guidelines are drawn from a review of evidence-based medical literature and patient outcomes. Well, that part at least is true. The guidelines are really high quality. To be certified by NAF, a provider must submit to an on-site inspection and complete a detailed questionnaire designed, designed to determine whether the provider complies with NAF standards. After the initial approval and certifications, members must complete questionnaires annually. So you can just lie through your teeth on the questionnaire, I guess. NAF reinspects members every five to seven years or more often if there's a complication or serious event with the patient. Uh, NAF seems to have pretty low standards of what constitutes a serious event. They, uh, I, I should have a link below um, when I called them and asked about the Annabelle. Oh, they wouldn't be a member if, if complications were, were serious, you know, like a dead 13 year old. That's not a serious complication. Gosnell submitted an application to become a NAF member in November 2009 and, apparently, astonishingly, the day after Karnamaya Mongar died. The NAF evaluator conducted a site review on December 14th and 15th, 2009. So, again, if you've heard descriptions of Gosnell's clinic, if you've seen pictures of Gosnell's clinic, 
the astonishing thing is that she was even there for two days. She didn't just walk in, smell the place, and say, oh, hell no, and walk out again. The NAF evaluator uh, conducted a site review on December 14th and 15th, 2009. Despite the odd fact that Gosnell's decision to seek NAF certification coincided with the patient's death at his clinic, he made no mention of this significant event to the evaluator before she visited. Well, why would you? In fact, it was not until after their final interview, after she had spent two days with Gosnell at the facility, that he informed her of Mrs. Mongar's death. I'm surprised he did. In preparation for NAF's visit, Latasha Lewis said that Gosnell and his wife frantically cleaned the facility. Uh, but there's only so much cat crap smell you can get out of a carpet. The doctor bought new lounge chairs to replace the bloody ones that were that were there, although by February 18th of 2010 they were filthy again. He also rehired former employee Della Mann, a registered nurse who was a friend of Randy Hutchins and a patient of Emil. Randy Hutchins referred Ms. Mann to Gosnell because the doctor had told Hutchins he wanted to hire a registered nurse for a short amount of time. Mann had worked at the clinic years earlier, but in fact Gosnell was not offering Mann a real job. He was paying to use her license for a few days. Gosnell hired Mann at $31 an hour to work 6 to 9 p.m. on Mondays and Tuesdays only. He told her that he wanted her to look at charts, evaluate lab work, and initial patient charts as if she a licensed nurse had been the person who had taken vital signs and recorded information in the charts. This short-term job lasted four days and coincided with a NAF site review. Mann said she quit because she was uncomfortable with Gosnell's fraud, including paying her with a check, then taking the check back and giving her cash. Gosnell accomplished what he intended. He ostensibly had a licensed registered nurse on her staff and her license number in his files during the NAF review. Now, of course, if the NAF evaluator was taking it seriously and being thorough, she would have checked and seen, okay, what was the hire date, blah, blah, blah. Despite these efforts, the NAF review did not go well. The first thing the evaluator noted when she arrived at 3801 Lancaster Avenue was the lack of an effective security system. Although the door was locked when she rang the bell, no one answered. Even though she could not gain entry by ringing, she was able to walk right in when a man exited the clinic. Once inside, she found the facility was packed with so much stuff, kind of crowded and piled all over the place, that she couldn't find a space to put her small overnight bag. She found the facility's layout confusing and was concerned that patients could not find their way around or in and out of it. She was also concerned that there were plants everywhere, including in the procedure room and rooms designated as labs. Most alarming was the bed where Gosnell told her out-of-state patients were allowed to spend the night. These patients were unattended and it was difficult to locate the bathroom facilities and exits. Such a practice does not meet NAF protocols. And uh, I do have to agree there that, that this was worse than uh, the other dirty NAF clinics. So, and again, why she didn't take one look at this and say, screw it, dude, <laughs> there's no fixing this, I do not know. The NAF evaluator watched a few first trimester procedures. She noticed no one was monitoring or taking vital signs of patients who were sedated during procedures. She asked Gosnell about the pulse oximeter that should have been used for monitoring, but he told her it was broken. Apparently, Karnamaya Mongar's death a month earlier had not caused Gosnell to obtain equipment that worked. The evaluator did not observe Gosnell's practice of allowing unlicensed workers to sedate patients when he was not at the facility as she was only there when Gosnell was there. Such a practice would not comply with NAF standards. I, I find it really annoying that the grand jury keeps, otherwise NAF is amazing. Yeah, you know, she went there and this was bad, but NAF would never allow that. NAF is good, NAF is good, NAF is good, NAF is good. I'm wondering if some money change hands with between uh, somebody at NAF and whoever wrote the grand jury report. The evaluator did note, however, that while she was talking to Gosnell in his office, a patient appeared to have been sedated by one of the staff. Such an action does not comport with NAF standards either. <clears throat> yeah, let's not forget that Hanan Rotom, who was a NAF member, had a receptionist administering general anesthesia. So, you know, how well NAF enforces this is a little questionable. The evaluator cautioned Gosnell that he should make sure he was complying with state requirements because many states, including Pennsylvania, do not allow unlicensed workers to administer IV medications. 
how about you just shouldn't do it? The level of medication administered was also troubling to the evaluator. She testified that Gosnell's own description of the effects of his routine second trimester dose, that the patient would feel no pain at all, was a description of deep sedation. She added that that would not really be a safe situation for him to be handling himself. She explained that when deep sedation or general anesthesia is administered, NAF standards not only require that the doctor performing the procedure be present when the anesthesia is administered, but they also require that another doctor or anesthesiologist administer the sedation and monitor the patient. Instead, Gosnell had Linda Williams, Sherry West, or his other unlicensed workers routinely administer anesthesia without proper supervision or appropriate monitoring of patients. The evaluator explained to the grand jury, as did several medical experts, that because everyone reacts differently to anesthesia, a doctor has to be prepared for a patient to slip into a level of sedation beyond that intended. In cases in which Gosnell's objective was deep sedation, therefore, he should have been prepared for the patient to react as if under general anesthesia. Significantly, it is not uncommon for patients under general anesthesia to lose the ability to breathe on their own. Gosnell's clinic, without the drug staff or equipment necessary to monitor, resuscitate, or assist his patients in breathing, was not even close to meeting NAF standards or any other standard of care. The evaluator noted that Pennsylvania requires that anesthesia be administered only by licensed personnel, a regulation that Gosnell failed to follow even during the NAF review. Again, why did she even stick around? Why didn't she look at this and go, this is broke? Aside from these life-threatening practices, the evaluator noted numerous deficiencies in the clinic's record keeping, including no notation of RH blood typing and no record of sedation medications administered or the level of sedation. The clinic's consent procedures also failed to meet NAF standards. Even with the evaluator watching, patients were not informed of the risk of medication, sedation, or the procedure itself. The evaluator testified that during the counseling she witnessed, a patient was told that Pennsylvania requires a 24-hour waiting period between when a patient is counseled and when the abortion can be performed. After stating the requirement, however, the counselor, according to the evaluator, said, okay, well, when do you want to come back for the abortion? Do you want to come back at 8 p.m.? When the patient's mother said, but I thought we had to wait 24 hours, the staff person responded, if you want to come back at 8 p.m., you can come back at 8 p.m. Patient confidentiality is another important standard for NAF that, and another that Gosnell flagrantly violated. The evaluate, evaluator was troubled to find throughout the office there were patient charts everywhere on desks, on this, the area that the upstairs sleeping area by the sleeping room, there were piles and piles and piles of medical records. That was, if it were in an area that was closed off and nobody had access to it, charts being stored there wasn't a big deal. But if there were patients in the sleeping room, who had to leave there to go to the restroom, they had full access to all those people's medical information if they wanted to look through it, and it was very, very concerning to me. When asked if she'd ever seen anything like the conditions and practices she observed at Gosnell's clinic at any of the roughly 100 clinics she visited in the United States, Canada, and Mexico, the evaluator answered no. Based on her observations, the evaluator determined that there were far too many deficiencies at the clinic and in how it operated to even consider admitting Gosnell to NAF membership. On January 4, 2010, she wrote to Gosnell informing him of NAF's decision and outlining the areas, excuse me, at which his clinic was not in compliance. The evaluator told her grand jury that this was the first time in her experience that NAF had outright rejected a pro uh, provider for membership. Usually if a clinic is able to fix deficiencies and come into compliance with the standards, NAF will admit them. Gosnell's clinic, however, was deemed beyond redemption. And again, they did not tell their own clinics to stop referring to him. They did not tell their clinic in Delaware to not have him work in their clinic and then take their patients to Pennsylvania. It was just, no, we don't want our sticker on your building. We understand that NAF's goal is to assist clinics to comply with its standards, not sanction them for deficiencies. Nevertheless, we have to question why an evaluator from NAF, whose stated mission is to ensure safe, legal, and acceptable abortion care and to promote health and justice for women, when you're not slut-shaming them for suing, did not report Gosnell to authorities. To the jurors, the most appalling thing revealed by the NAF review is not that Gosnell tried to bluff his way through the application project, 
process with a borrowed nurse and some new lounge chairs, it is that he made no efforts to address the grave deficiencies in his practice that had caused Karnamaya Mongar's death. And I would say that it should have been more shocking that they, again, they didn't tell their member facilities to not refer to this guy. They did not tell the people in Delaware to get rid of this guy. Nope. Just like I said, they, they didn't want his label, their, their label on his clinic. So, let me... Errors, did you do? Well, I'm I'm gonna close out now. We're already 20 minutes into it, but I'll cover more Kermit Gosnell and the National Abortion Federation in future uh, installments.